Hello and welcome to episode 68 of Off the Bandstand. My name is Christian Wiggs. I am your host. Today's episode is Benny Benack III, a trumpeter, vocalist, band leader, and producer living in New York City. Benny has been featured across the globe with tours in Asia and Europe, as well as domestic sightings at famed clubs such as Birdland, Mesro, Bemelman's Bar at the Carlisle Hotel, and moderating panels at the annual Jazz Congress held at Jazz at Lincoln Center. This episode was part of Bandstand Presents' ongoing series, The Residency, that facilitates community between the Austin and New York scenes through collaborative shows with the Christian Wiggs Big Band, the staple Monday Night Jam at the Elephant Room, and episodes of Off the Bandstand. In this episode, we talk about throwing caution to the wind to pursue pie-in-the-sky projects. We also talk about the start of the manifestation of the many projects that will surely result in a Bachelor-esque BB3 Nation, and an impromptu cutting session that may very well lead to a jazz spin-off of Epic Rap Battles of History. Moving on to the featured release of the week, this is Benny's A Lot of Livin' To Do, which is his sophomore record as a band leader, highlighting his proficiency in all creative facets. The record features an all-star lineup of Christian McBride, Ulysses Owens Jr., Takeshi Obayashi, Alita Moses, and Veronica Swift. If you want to support this release directly, you can head over to BennyBenackJazz.com. And for all things Benny, all the time, you can follow him on Instagram, at BBJazzIII. On the calendar coming up for Bandstand Presents, we have on Thursday, April 14th, the Christian Wiggs Big Band meets Clark Summers, followed by Clark Summers Lens on Friday, April 15th, and finally on Saturday, April 16th, we'll have Matisse Picard back in town for his Live at the Museum album release show. Tickets are available for the limited in-person audience at monksjazzclub.com, and as always, every show will be live-streamed with links to donate in the top right-hand corner of the screen. And for all upcoming events here at Bandstand Presents, you can visit bandstandpresents.com. That is it for all of the mentions and announcements this week. Let's dive into episode 68, Benny Benack III. This is Off the Bandstand. Or somebody who definitely like understands the idea of curation. We played last night on the show with a bunch of the different big band charts, ones that are from both of your records uh, that are very, very varied. That should be a title of very, an album. Varied. Very varied. That's right. Or a serial. That could right. also be a thing. Very, very, very uh, varied. Oh, <laughs> varied. It's varied. the new Count Chocula thing. <laughs> right. Um, but I am curious uh, because I've now seen you in big band setting. I've seen you in small group settings, in bars, in clubs. Is there a difference in the way that you approach uh, curating a set list for a live show and also an album? Oh, man, that's a good question. I mean, I think the best albums kind of take you on that same journey and kind of tell that same story. There is an arc to yeah. an album in the way that we program a set for mm -hmm. a live show. The challenge being, of course, with a live show, the audience is there in real time. Yeah. And with an album, it's something that it's kind of like in, you're, you have a good faith agreement that they're going to listen to it start to finish. Sure. And the interesting thing now, of course, we're realizing the way people consume music is it's not a given that someone is going to put on your album from start to finish and sit there in one sitting and listen to it which has pros and cons, but one thing that I think speaking about very musical offerings is that we have a little bit more freedom on an album to go in different directions because one song might be on this playlist for you know jazz R&B, another song might be on world music jazz playlist, another song might be on classic jazz, big band sound, you know, so you can actually almost have these little singles. And in the old days, the idea that jazz albums and jazz music would be like pop and have singles sure. was something that labels were never even considering. And now it's like, oh yeah, which songs on your record are going to be singles? You know, yeah. it's totally, totally changed the game. And I think that's for the better because it allows us to make albums that are broader. Yeah, right. You know, what's really interesting is that one of a kind 
and a lot of living to do, but especially like narrowing in on one of a kind, uh, you do have an album there that is varied and it does feel like each one can be a single, but whenever it works together at the same time, it does implore people to keep listening because there's never something that is super similar right after the other. Uh, was that a specific cr consideration of yours making that? You know, it's something that I've thought about a lot as an artist and something that I've gotten a lot of pushback from the industry, from labels, from mentors over time where they've said, the only way to be an artist is you have to pigeonhole yourself. You pick a lane. Are you a singer? Are you a trumpet player? Are you doing straight ahead? Are you doing modern? You know, mm. basically saying you have to make things more digestible and palatable for people. And I remember I was at the Jazz Congress at Lincoln Center a few years ago, and I was in a competition that was like make it was like Shark Tank, but <laughs> Jazz Congress. It was like make your perfect pitch. And the winner gets $1,000. And my pitch was basically for a lot of living to do at that time. Okay. And my pitch was like, I want to make an album that has something for everyone. That mom is cooking in the kitchen and something comes on and she can cook to it. Yeah. But also the jazziest jazz nerd in New York City who's the biggest snob isn't going to be able to talk shit on it. <laughs> and I wanted to find an album that was able to cover both of those bases. And one of the one of the guys that was on the panel was actually one of the executives at Mac Avenue, and he was kind of just like, well, that's a great idea. That's pretty pie in the sky, and uh, good luck with that because, you know, you just can't do it. It's too broad. And, uh, you know, I put out the album by myself, but I think the numbers speak for themselves. It uh. reached quite a wide audience. <laughs> so who's to say who was right or wrong there? But... I didn't win the competition, but it was a great album, so. Yeah, and that's, <laughs> man, that's, that's, and it is. It is a very killing album. That is something that whatever you said, they're like, well, that's a great pie in the sky idea. Throw their head back and laugh. Good luck to you, kid. Yeah. I feel like that's what we're getting a lot of right now, but we're getting now, like, not into the idea of where it's crushing dreams, but a lot of people that are of around our age. I know you're a couple years older than I, but like- Thanks for reminding me uh, Thank well, you, thanks well, a lot. It was a joke, cool. it was a joke. We'll, we'll fix it in post, we'll swap some yeah, faces. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, Instagram filters are, are amazing. Yeah, no, uh, actually we were just gonna deep fake Tom Cruise's face online for this whole thing, so. We could, could you give fine. that maniacal laugh yeah. for us, you know? Like, do you want, <laughs> should I do like an Oprah thing, like climb up on the chair? Yeah. Yes, yes. They're very buoyant, by the way, the cushions. Yeah. You know, Wait, you wasn't know. the Tom Cruise, when he got up on the couch on Oprah, he was talking yeah. about like a relationship or something? Uh, and I like have a girlfriend now. I should be like, do. I'm so excited. You do. You do. Oh, man. Well, let's not pull focus. Well, 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 we won't pull focus. But what we will say is if you want to know more, there's a bombshell report on Instagram oh, that's right. this morning. That's right. Follow. On Follow for more. Tuesday. It was a very, very smart day for you to post that, by the way. Tuesday. Tuesday. February 22nd. Two, 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 anyone watching, that's the day of our, of our filming here. That's right. But uh, yeah, I guess going back to that is like we're starting to see people break out of that. Especially especially like you and Brian, right? Like where your albums, you're like, I'm not gonna be held down by that. This show, I've said this before, so I won't you know, speak at length, but like off the bandstand, I pitched to like five different people beforehand in confidence and they were like, that doesn't sound interesting. Nobody's gonna wanna, wanna watch a show only about jazz musicians. You're gonna need to try to get like Jay-Z on the show for anybody to care. It's right. like, well, no, I think that therein lies the problem is that we kind of like fetishize like some of these people who are like the top of the industry when we don't realize that there are equally valid and amazing musicians who we need to dial in our focus on their personalities. And so for you to kind of throw caution to the wind and say, no, if if nobody wants to back this, I'm just going to do it myself, right. really shows to be like a very fruitful um, and, and you know, trend-setting way to transform the industry a bit. Yeah, I mean, I think it just goes to show, you know, whether it's my album or Brian's new project that just came out or, you know, Bandstand Presents off the bandstand, just the idea that it's great if you're, you know, if your number gets called, if you get your golden ticket, if you have somebody come along and just give you a handout, that's wonderful. And I don't shame any of my friends or peers, colleagues mm. that have had that kind of good fortune. Sure. But a lot of times you're going to get a lot more no's than you are yes's, a lot more doors closing your face. And at a certain point, you have to have the conviction in your idea and your vision and your belief, whether it's an album or a show or, or anything, you, ha you have to have that belief in it. And then you just have to make it happen yourself and mm. figure that other people are going to jump on the bandwagon 
you know, down the road. Yeah. And I think the beautiful thing is taking that leap of faith and getting some uh, of, you know, affirmation of that and rewards. And, you know, that happened with my album, the reception of Brian's stuff, the success right. of what you guys have built here. You know, because it is a leap of faith. It is scary to, to kind of jump off the deep end and know that there's no parachute there and you're yeah. going for it. So it's a good feeling to to see some of that hard work kind of come to fruition, as you said. Yeah, of course. And, you know, those are talking about external kind of considerations, but then also making an album. Like, for me, when I made my first album, I just wanted to get something out there. Um, so it would be, I mean, frankly speaking, I wanted something that was going to be easier to market for gigs, right? Sure. Getting gigs. Um, but at the same time, you know, whenever I'll have you know, my students who say, when should I make my first album? What should I be waiting for? I was like, man, that's a profoundly like personal thing that you need to figure out for yourself. But one thing you should know is that like, it's virtually impossible to take a first impression back, you know, and if somebody doesn't dig on the thing, that's fine. But if you do want to win them over for whatever reasons you might have personally, you're going to need to make sure that you really kind of like start to exponentially increase the quality of the thing you're doing. For you, whenever you did one of a kind, you were 23, right, when you mm -hmm. recorded it. So what were you waiting for, you know, yourself, if anything, kind of boxes to check? What considerations went into you finally being like, now I want to record this album? Well, I think I fell into the same trap that a lot of young artists do in that we are almost paralyzed by the idea of that first impression. And we mm. put so much importance on it that you almost, I, I know artists haven't put out their first record that I'm waiting for it. And part of it is it's like the longer you go and you haven't done it, it just the pressure builds and builds. Sure. And everybody wants their first album to be number one on the charts and centerfold and downbeat and jazz times. And, you know, you have this idea of kind of this, you know, meteoric burst into the <laughs> sky and, you know, your career has exploded. But I fortunately ha had good advice from mentors, uh, Ulysses Owens Jr., who right. played on both records, but um, really was a producer on the second record, but was very instrumental in getting me to record the first one. Yeah. And also Michael Dees, uh, trombonist extraordinaire. Uh, I remember we were teaching at a camp for Seiko watches in Japan and they kind of cornered me in a cigar bar one night and they <laughs> said, look, you're 23. It's time. You're touring the world. You're here yeah. in Japan with us. You know, we're 10 years older than you We're established guys. You're on this level. It's time to make your album. Stop dilly dallying make it happen it's time you know and also they said look this album is just a snapshot of who you are today as an artist and right. you know what your first album unless you're Nora Jones it's probably not going to be number one on the charts and for a lot of people it goes back to what I was saying about the idea of like some people get this Willy Wonka golden ticket right. and that's great but the reality is for most people it's something that happens in in steps and really, your first record is just that first recognition. And right. for all these radio DJs around the country, the first time your name goes on their desk, they're going to say, huh, this is someone new, Benny Benack. Okay, cool. Maybe I'll play something. Maybe I won't. And then you know what? Two years later, another record comes out, and they say, oh, yeah, I, th I think I remember this guy's name. Yeah, okay, let me put that in this pile. And you have a third record, fourth record. It's just about continuing to kind of build that presence and each right. record is kind of a stepping stone so you can't start going up the ladder if you don't have the first one so if i had a piece of advice for other artists it's like even if you don't think you're ready just get in the studio and document where you're at now it doesn't have to be your greatest opus you know of your life it just you got to get the ball rolling yeah, exactly. And people love to go back, you know, like later down the road, 10 years, people love to go back to the first one and see how somebody's evolved. And especially another thing, it was cool that you were saying that Ulysses was on both and then he produced the second one. Um, and was that co-produced? Did you also produce or did you try to keep your hands off of the On the second producing? record? Yeah. yeah, it was really... <clears throat> We, we, we did a lot of it together, you know, it was hand in hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, people just love seeing that, that kind of continuity, specifically on the producing thing, is like, I am somebody who has a difficulty, um, you know, even once we started filming on set, right, like Off the Bandstand was entirely in my house, I was just learning how to use iMovie, then Final Cut, and then, you know, uh, doing all the editing, all the hosting, whatever. Uh, and then once we got onto this set and we started to have people on staff that were doing editing for me, 
it's been really hard for me to relinquish control because I do have this very clear vision and I don't want to compromise that. But at the same time, I realize that there are ways that I just get way in my head that I need that more objective person to give me their input on how it actually comes across. How did you strike that balance between you and Ulysses on the record? Well, it, it's exactly what you're saying. And you have to realize that any project, and especially an album for a musician, it is like your baby. It is mm -hmm. your child. And so you're going to be protective of that. And you're going to be you know, very careful who you relinquish sure. creative licensing to. And so for me, I wasn't going to just have any producer. And there was actually a moment with a lot of living to do before that album was made where Ulysses had gone to great lengths to put me in touch with some really, really big shot producers. Mm. You know, there was a guy out in LA and he's worked with such and such and he's worked with such and such and you know, such and such is Grammy award winning album. He produced that. So sure. you're going to fly this guy in from LA. You're going to put him up for a week and I'm going to send him some music of yours. He's going to take a listen and tell you what you need to do. Mm. And Ulysses put that in motion. He wasn't even pitching himself as the producer. Yeah. And I was excited because it was like everything this guy touched to get a Grammy. And it was yeah. an honor that he would even consider it. And he did listen to some of my music. And he came back with his sort of reading, his feedback. And he said, I think you should do Chet Baker Sings, mm. but we're going to redo it. And there's not going to be any swing. It's going to be all pocket. It's going to be all groove. People don't want to hear swing anymore. We're going to do straight eights. It's going to be groove. It's going to be cool. You're going to do all the music from Chet Baker Sings. And you're like, you know, good looking white guy playing trumpet sure. singing. It's perfect. But we're going to do it for a modern audience. And I remember thinking to myself, like sleepless nights leading mm -hmm. up to that, because I had to agree to this with this guy. And there sure. were thousands of dollars in the waiting to pay him, to fly him out, to put him up. And I just remember thinking like, man, I've got Christian McBride confirmed to play this record <laughs> and I'm going to have Christian McBride on the record and we're not going to swing. We're not going to tip yeah. like one song yeah, and yeah, I have right. Christian McBride there <laughs> and I'm not going to swing. And you know what? I was terrified, terrified to tell Ulysses anything other than what he had set into motion because he sure. stuck his neck out to, to get me into contact with this guy. And I slaved over how to email him, how to text message him, how to call mm -hmm. him. And I sent him this big letter one night at like 4.30 in the morning, basically saying, man, I just, I, I have a feeling in the pit of my stomach. This isn't, this isn't the direction. Sure. You know, I believe in something else. And I was so nervous and I hit the send button and I went to sleep and I woke up the next day and Ulysses was like, man, I'm so proud of you. Like, this is beautiful this is exactly what you needed to hear like you need to have conviction in your own art yeah and you need to know what you want to say as an artist and to that point I was sort of wishy-washy and I was kind of could have been influenced in any direction mm -hmm. and it took someone proposing something else to me for me to say no I don't want that yes I want this and Ulysses was like good you have conviction you know what you want to say as an artist let's go with that let's work on that together. So then out of that, Ulysses said, okay, well, actually, I want to produce this with you and help you find this vision. So the way that happened was terrifying, <laughs> but I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. Oh, man, that is such a beautiful story. I never told yeah. that story. That's crazy. <laughs> I hope that producer guy isn't watching this and gets pissed. But Oh, uh, no, man, he'll find it in dear. Hit me up for the next record, man. Let's get some Grammys. He's ready to do some pocket shit. Hey, me too. Me too. Me too. <laughs> it says that on the chart. Right? <laughs> yeah, I only have eyes yeah. for you. Some pocket shit. Yeah, right? Quarter note equals <laughs> 160 or whatever. There you go. Yeah, man. Um, the record also highlights specifically like these beautiful snapshots of relationships um, of like these either duets or duos. So, right, you have Christian and you guys do Gravy Waltz. So killing, by the way, just like totally channeling the entire essence of Ray Brown. So amazing. Unbelievable. Um, and then you have, you know, Where's the Love with Alita. And then, of course, the famed social call with Veronica. Um, as you were deciding, because, you know, talking about that with that other producer, you found out what you didn't want to do. As you were deciding what you did want to do, there's also an entire new consideration of who you want to do it with. So what led you to each one of those people specifically? Well, we'll start with McBride because he was the first person to sign off. Actually, I sent Christian McBride's manager at the time six months worth of availability of days that we could record mm -hmm. from like January to, to June or July or something. And I was thinking, yeah, I'll probably record like maybe mid-March, April, put it out in the fall. And this was like 
winter break. So uh, it was like December. <laughs> this manager goes, Christian is available July or January 4th. Yes or no? Like that was it. I got <laughs> one day out of six months of dates and it was less than a month away. Yeah. So it was like the first thing I set up was, okay, Christian McBride's down. Great. Let's find a studio. Let's find an engineer. Let's get a band, whatever. We have to do it this day. Yeah, right. So he was really the linchpin. It was the first thing I had to have Christian McBride involved. Mm-hmm. Because I knew Ulysses and him have a great hookup. Sure. He was in his trio for many years, played in his big band. So once I had Christian, then we set up the rest of the dominoes around that. And as far as Alita and Veronica go, you know, they were both friends mm. first. People that I had worked with. Alita went out to Shanghai for Jazz and Ligon Center with my band. I've known Veronica. We've been playing together for years. Yeah. And when she was a finalist in the Monk Vocal Competition and had a concert um, at the Tribeca Performing Arts mm-hmm. Center, she had me play on that concert and her dad played piano. Okay. I played on her most recent album before she was signed to Mac Avenue. Right. So these were people that I was comfortable with. We're friends off off stage, we had a relationship, but also, I mean, I, I look at Alita and Veronica as these stars in the making, and yeah. sure enough, a couple years later, you've seen them ascend to these incredible heights, yeah. and I just feel really fortunate that, you know, the old adage you always say, we, I, I'm so glad we could, we could get her while we could afford her, folks, <laughs> and it's really true, because if I went back and tried to you know, put lightning in a bottle twice with social call with Veronica, yeah. she'd probably be off touring somewhere with Chris Bodie. I couldn't get her for a year. Yeah, you know? So I'm, I'm so grateful that the stars aligned for that, you know? Oh, beautiful. And then also just before we started rolling, you were telling me about an idea of a tune from Oliver, right? You also have a lot of living to do. It implies, you know, um, an affinity for musical theater. And like, that's what I grew up with. Again, I talk about that all the time. I won't you know, go on about it, but I don't know your involvement with theater or you know, fascination or how that started to enter. Of course, I mean, a lot of these tunes mm-hmm. are you know, great American songbook tunes because they were just around that golden age, but how did you start to consider those being in your, your rep? Well, I'm glad that you asked because a <laughs> lot of times these interviews, people focus on the lineage on my father's side of the family mm. because my dad, Benny Benack Jr., plays the sure. sax. My grandfather, Benny Benack Sr., was a very prominent jazz trumpeter. So that's like a very easy kind of theme to jump <laughs> off of. Sure. But when those interviews come out, my mom always says, well, you're always just talking about your father, Ben, and you should mention that your mother is a voice professor at Carnegie Mellon, one of the greatest drama departments in the world. And it's totally <laughs> true. So I'm glad that you asked that, Christian. So I have a moment. I don't know which camera I should, I should be looking at. I have a Mama moment Benack. to give all the credit in the world to Claudia Benack, my dear mother, for which I have gotten so much. Um, but it's true. My mom is, is a singer. My yeah. parents met on, on a gig, you know. And she was primarily an opera singer, a music theater singer, yeah. of course, sings jazz and pop too. But her professional life, she's been a professor at Carnegie Mellon's School of Drama for 15, 20 years, which is you know a factory for Broadway. Yeah, sure. Every one of her students moves to New York and becomes famous. She taught Josh Groban. She's taught you know just a litany of, of icons in that world. So... I grew up Saturday mornings being rudely awakened at 9.30 a.m. by Oklahoma and Annie and Oliver and these private students who would come to the house and sing these songs. So as much as I grew up driving to baseball practice, listening to my dad's Monty Alexander, Harry Mm. Connick, Nicholas Payton, Roy Hargrove records, I also was just surrounded by music theater. And, you know, my mom's students from Carnegie Mellon would be my babysitters. And I would go to see the students in their cabaret performances and their shows at the end of the semester. I, you know, I remember sitting at these rehearsals, you know, for the jazz nutcracker with mm. the with the Point Park Ballet in, in Pittsburgh with my dad. And so I was surrounded by that world yeah. as well and influenced by it. And, you know, people always ask me, who's like, who's someone you look up to? Who's a career? Who's an archetype you'd like to follow? And I always say Harry Connick Jr. And that starts by being an icon of jazz music right. as Harry is. But he also was on a pile of Broadway shows. He was on Will and Grace. He was in movies. He had a daytime talk show. Yeah. And there is an element of acting and, and theater and presenting that I want to get into at some point. But 
you want to be Harry Connick Jr., you first have to kind of like take over jazz. So I'm still working uh, on that part. But down the road, you know, I, I would love to be involved with that because I did the musicals in high school. You know, I was the lead in all the shows, you know, when I wasn't like going to baseball practice or something. I feel like high school musical was like yeah. loosely based on my life. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's just it's just like you, man. I, I grew up around that as much as jazz. And it's really cool to see how that kind of influences the repertoire you pick mm. and mine too. I think it's something that's unique yeah. in this in this era. Yeah, did you see the band's visit when it was on Broadway? I did see it and actually I was in final callbacks to be in that show. You oh know? My God. Because they were like the guy that plays trumpet or whatever. Yeah. There's not that many guys that yeah. can like sorta of act and sorta of play trumpet. And I was close. I got oh, down to the no, end. But no. actually the guy that they picked to do it was a trumpet player that went to Manhattan School of Music. So okay. I actually knew him. Oh, and, man. you know, uh, I hate him. I'm so mad I didn't get it. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. I was like... Can you look in the camera I, and Yeah, right, him right? Yeah, right. No, of course. I was really happy for him. And I couldn't have done it anyway because I had so many other important <laughs> engagements. But, no, but of course, like that kind of... Those kind of yeah. opportunities, when something comes up like that, you're like, oh, this is the role I was born right. for. You know? So hopefully there's another band's visit down the road that I can... Uh, get a little further in the callbacks. So. Yeah, that's why I brought it up. I was like, oh, that would have been a perfect role. I know. I hate, to, ah. I hate to add insult to, ah. I know, yeah. it's so evasive. <laughs> uh, man, speaking of Harry Connick Jr., and, and I, I did want to ask you about that, if that was something that was kind of in your purview where you were like, I would like to go and do, I, I think we could all, just as a society, there's a lot of brokenness around, we could all benefit from the daytime television show, <laughs> Benny. I think, you know, we can have that. I'm feeling it, honestly, man. You're kind of creating, the, we're manifesting it. We are. My legs are in the exact, like, talk show position. There's a mug here. I'm feeling it, man. I'm totally, I'm totally feeling it. But you beat me to it, so. Well, no, let's let's switch the vibe. I'm done, actually. I don't want to be here switch anymore. Let's, let's, let's switch chairs. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but, yeah. So I mean, Christian. What, no, I'm kidding. Please, please, please. <laughs> hey, I, I'm, I'm game, man. Yeah, man. Let's work. Uh, no, but if you had to pick, you know, because Harry does do, we're not on first name basis, Harry Connick does <laughs> so many uh, uh, aspects of that. If there was like the next one that you'd want to add, you know, would it be television? Would it be film? Would it be something like this, like bandstand? What, what is kind of the next thing you would be itching to do given the opportunity? I think the most realistic avenue mm. would be doing some sort of online series, some sort of show. Yeah. I mean, I've thought about a podcast, but I just think that isn't utilizing my sex appeal and my oh. good looks, you know? I yes, totally I have an, the dulcet tones of my voice yes. are enough for a podcast, but I just feel like the visual component, obviously there's a lot to, to like here. Right, right, so that's not really utilizing the full breadth of my talents. Right. Why do you think we put this on YouTube, Of man? course. It's the of singer, course. you know, we're just like so self-absorbed. You know? Of course. But, you know, I think <laughs> some, some kind of web series, you know, maybe is a sort of first foot Mm -hmm. first step into that. Um, I have to be honest, one of the things that I think of is like late night TV hosts, mm -hmm. you know, I think of Carson and Doc Severinsen. And if there was some sort of pie in the sky vision, maybe it wouldn't be being Jimmy Fallon or, or being mm -hmm. Carson or, or Letterman per se, but being like the band leader, being the yeah. Doc Severinsen, being the John Batiste, being yeah. the Paul Schaefer and kind of getting to have the best of both worlds, still being in the band, still making music, yeah. but also, you know, getting some shine on camera too. So maybe if I had a, a long-term goal, it would be some kind of hosting vibe yeah. like that where I'm still getting to be a musician, but also getting to kind of have fun the other side of things. Yeah. You know? Well, Matt and uh, Jake Block, you know, have been talking a lot about how, you know, TikTok is real big for, for Law Reserve. Blowing but up. let's let's be honest, man. You were the trendsetter for jazz TikTok, man. You were like, you were on it before a lot of us were were on it, man. You were you were creating primo content. I don't Just know about primo content, <laughs> but I was definitely uh, I'm definitely addicted to my phone and social yeah. media, if that's what you mean. So yeah. I'll take it. You're you're certainly painting it in a much nicer picture than <laughs> than, you know, like my mom who says I'm looking at my phone too much. It's all you know? a plug for the brand, man. I'm just trying to get you those followers on TikTok right <laughs> now. You, Everybody bro. go. Come Everybody on, go. Man, uh, who has wowed you lately? What's a show, whether it's been like, you know, something at a club, 
or it's been a musical. What have you seen lately? What art have you consumed that has really just been like, damn? Man, you know, I think uh, it's really the the story, kind of the com- most compelling thing to come out of the pandemic in New York City and mm-hmm. jazz at large during the last couple of years has been what Emmett was able to do at his apartment and yeah. in, in Emmett Emmett's place, as it were. Right. Um, and it's cool for me to kind of just take a step back and see the the reach that that's had because I remember when Emmett and Russell and Kyle were starting it and it was so early on that it was almost taboo because in New York we were still technically at a stay-at-home order. Sure. But because Kyle and Russell and Emmett all lived within two blocks of each other, sure. they were able to be in each other's bubble. Right. So they were together hanging out. They weren't seeing anybody else. Yeah. But it was so early on in the process. No one else thought about live streaming. No one had cameras. People at that point weren't even thinking, let me pop on Instagram Live. Let me right. go on my computer on Facebook. The first Emmett's place was literally him hitting the record button on his laptop. It was so <laughs> janky. And I was there too because, yeah. I, you know, they were 15 blocks up the street from me. Sure. And just kind of seeing how quickly that evolved. And then also, the reach that that's had, it, it, it showed the possibilities of what something like Bandstand can do yeah. and what the live stream that they have here at Monks, you know, it just kind of showed that with a little bit of luck, if like you kind of catch lightning in a bottle, right. you never know who's going to be paying attention. And in the ensuing tours and times that I've been able to get back on the road, I'm telling you, man, I've done all these gigs domestically and abroad mm-hmm. without fail. And I don't like to say this to Emmett because he doesn't need anyone else to tell him again, you know, how brilliant (laughs) and smart he is. So I don't like to give him too much credit, but I've had people come up to me at every gig that say, we love watching you on Emmett's, like in anywhere in the world. And and they say, oh, we always tune in and it's so great to see you. So we had to buy tickets and come see you. And that right there speaks to the idea. It, It kind of fights back against the notion of we hear all these musicians, mm. you know, when Spotify Wrapped comes out and people say, I'm boycotting Spotify. They sure. don't pay us enough. Like, musicians, we need to stand up for ourselves. Blah, blah, blah. Why are you giving away your live streaming for free? You need to get paid to perform. Mm. And I get that. I'm not trying to, sure. you know, I just mock them openly. But I'm not, <laughs> I understand that viewpoint. But, I mean, when you get a response like that, people are buying tickets to a physical show in the real world. That is tangible. Mm. That is an effect of giving away something for free, you know? And people have emailed me to book me for concerts, for tours that have said, I saw you on this live stream that I was doing for free. And now I have a tour in California because of it. So, you know, I, I get kind of like the old way of thinking with streaming Mm. and with, with, you know, content where you want to get paid for things that you're doing now in the moment. But I just think that's the landscape now. And, and, you know, there's always people watching. You never know who's watching. You never know people around the world, what country is tuning in to this episode right now. Right. The world has never been smaller and and we need to take advantage of that. It's a super interesting dynamic, man. Like the, I almost liken it to, you know, because I do think that there is a point in which, you know, if we just am con or if we're just constantly giving something away where it's like for free, where it can de incentivize. But what I would more strongly than that notion push back as like a devil's advocate argument is that like it is completely the same vibe as trying to win over your audience in a live situation. Sure. If you, it's, it, it is an investment, and I don't want to make that sound like a financial kind of uh, uh, thinking of the word investment, but it's an investment in your audience in building a relationship because if you win somebody over, they will want to support yeah. you by means of the fact that they just have such an admiration for the thing that you're doing, but if you put everything behind a paywall, people will, people won't miss what they don't already have. Right, right. They need to have a little bit of it. You know, that's why it's like, you know, let's say that Emmett wanted to do something where he took, you know, best of and got all the stuff like mixed and mastered and like album ready, not to say it is not already. Wow, well, that's a that's a brilliant then, idea, Christian. Uh, wow. And then put it behind and then said like, hey, you can go to the Patreon now, you can get this kind of thing if you really wanted like the hi-fi, whatever, or ultra hi-fi. 
people would pay for that because yeah. they want then to have that like, oh, cool. Like, cause then they almost feel like they're in on the process of the thing from start to finish, as yeah. opposed to being like, I came out with this thing. You can't have it until you pay for it. It's like, yeah. no, take them along. No, there's no, the there's no problem in trying to monetize something, but you got to give them something to, you got to give them some incentive. Yeah. And you know, with, with Emmett's thing, he has his subscribers, his version of a Patreon and you know, he pushes that. Sure. Yeah. But he still has something that he's offering, you know, for free, just for general consumption. And then it's right. like, yeah, if you're believe in this, if you want to support, if you want to kind of peek behind the curtain, then, then pay blah, blah, yeah. blah per month, you know, right. and that's totally fine. But I think it's kind of combined, like getting the best of both worlds where mm. you're not like, like you said, you're not closing out people that could be a potential audience right. right out of the gate. So I know we deviated a bit from your question, but it was just, it's hard for me yeah. to think of another project or another group or album because we're only just starting to get back to people playing and gigs mm -hmm. and being on the road and, you know, just kind of seeing what has developed with live streaming has really kind of been the story yeah. of the music the last couple of years. Yeah, you've been in the New York scene for like, over 10 years now, mm -hmm. right? So this might seem like kind of one of those general or vague questions that people might ask on like an interview show, but I, I genuinely am curious, specifically in New York or otherwise, because you've toured the world, how have you seen the landscape of jazz change? You know, we talk about live streams, but like in, in every facet, how have you seen kind of the, the music itself uh, evolving over the past 10 years? Well, I definitely think there is there is a renewed appreciation for it, not just from the musicians, but obviously also from the audiences. Mm. And it was a really cool feeling over the pandemic in New York City, particularly when things started coming back in mm -hmm. small increments. So outdoor dining, to, to go drinks, all right, we can play on the sidewalk. Right. And seeing people come to a jam session on the sidewalk play a rhythm changes and then have a tear in their eye and come up to me and say, I haven't played music with other human beings for six months, right. you know? And every night that I played a gig, I had that conversation with someone because for months, this person was coming out for the first time. For months, this person was coming to a concert. And, you know, I, I remember coming home to Pittsburgh and doing a concert at the Manchester Craftsman's Guild, one of the mm. premier MCG, you know, they have their own record label, but in Pittsburgh, that was where I got to see every jazz luminary growing up. Sure. And after boosters and vaccines came out, that was the first concert my mom was able to go to. Mm. And she was vaccinated and had two masks on, but just having my mom in the audience, being yeah. able to play this concert, like made me want to cry, yeah. you know? And I think you can hear that in the music. I mean, the show that we did here last night with your big band in a packed house that was also live streaming, the energy was just incredible. Electric. And it seems, it seems kind of corny or cliche to say like, oh, we'll never take it for granted again. But it's true, man. Like, people come up to you after the show. Even last night, and people were like, we haven't seen a show. It's our first time out in Austin yeah. hearing live music and so long. And, you know, that is an experience. But then there's also people that are watching the live stream, that watch content like this, yeah. that maybe they're immunocompromised or maybe they have a complication and they're still waiting to be able to go out live. Right. But tuning in and watching your show on their computer is what, you know, keeps them from just falling into a spiral of depression, you know? Yeah. So I think that if there is some sort of silver lining to this, you know, tragedy that the whole world has gone through yeah. is that the arts is kind of having a renaissance, you know, the roaring twenties are roaring <laughs> in part because people are realizing what it means to like go out and be a part of a shared experience yeah. and see live music. And I've seen that. I've seen that on live streams in the comments, and I've seen it in the room with people. And I think it's something that we should all be trying to, to bottle up and, and take that momentum and, and do something with it. And that's yeah. what you're doing. That's what Monks is doing. That's what Bandstand's doing. That's what I am doing. Yeah. So, you know. You are truly exceptional at building community. Like, it's something that I've obviously, like, everybody kind of knows, you know, on the the BB Jazz 3 Instagram account. Plug that's for the right, account. That's right, follow now. Uh, you're, I mean, you're the king of the content. I mean, that's, that's just like goes without saying. But in person, like especially, you know, every 
hope that I had for this residency program, bring people down. So that way, like, my goal was that people here and whoever we bring in can say equally, no matter what city they go to, they know a jazz musician in that city. Mm. So they don't go and go, oh, what's the scene like? Oh, I'm just wanna, I want them to say, no, I know this person. They can hit them up on social media, give them a text and say, hey, are you playing? If they say that they're not, go check this person out. It just continues to build the community. But the way that you foster jam sessions, especially, and you talk to a crowd and you like interacted with the musicians in our run through, it's so clear that you you keep intentionality at the forefront of your convictions. And there's no like uh, specific segue that I had uh, for that. It was just me wanting to specifically recognize that man because it, it is so admirable. And like the personality that you bring to this is the reason why like this music is going to live on from, from a community standpoint, not to mention musically as well. Well, I, I appreciate that, man. But I, I think you touched on it, kind of where that motivation comes from or where that intention on my part of trying to foster that community is to keep this music going. You said mm -hmm. that right at the end. And there really is this built in uh, kind of core mission statement of jazz is that before there were, you know, jazz major degrees being handed mm -hmm. out at every university, jazz was an oral tradition that was mm -hmm. passed down. You know, it's like, having these tribes where there's one storyteller and all the stories of your ancestors are passed down from the guy whose who's gig it is in the tribe sure. to remember everybody's stories. Like, that's what jazz was. And if you weren't hearing it from an older musician that mm -hmm. could tell you what time it was on a, on a jam session or tell you that you messed up and didn't know a song, so you go home and learn it. Like, that was how this tradition was passed on. Mm -hmm. And now, of course... It has been, you know, institutionalized and you can go to Stephen Feifke's website and purchase PDFs of all of his courses and Chad LB and all these things. And that's Chad great, pounds. too. That's great, too, because, I mean, I got Zoom students, too, and yeah. I got to make a buck. So, you know, sign up for lessons. We can cover a lot. But <laughs> a apart from that, there is this element of this tradition, this music, this uniquely American art form mm. is passed down word of mouth, person right. to person, right? And there's also this idea that we're all in it together because everybody knows the stats of jazz has 1% of the market share and 1% of all, blah, blah, blah. but you know, that's not dark to me. That just means, hey, like we got to fight for our 1%. We got to fight for our slice of the pie. And you have to make people want to dig jazz, yeah. you know, because we're not what's being spoon fed to them. Mm -hmm. So it's it, the onus is on us. If we want to keep this music alive, we ha we owe it to ourselves to share it to people and to make it relatable to an audience of people at a bar at a jam session that don't know, you know, John Coltrane from Jimmy Heath, from, sure. you know. And so, yeah, I do think about those things. But also, I had musicians growing up in Pittsburgh that took me under their wing that scolded me if I acted out of pocket at a jam session. Mm. And and all those lessons that were taught to me. I'm so grateful for. So when we had all those young cats coming out to the jam session and hanging, like I'm not going to vibe them. I want them to be as excited about the music as I am. And I want mm. them to tell their friends. I want them to grow up and teach some other kid a song at the yeah. jam session, you know, because that's how we keep this music alive. So, you know, you talk about building a community and what you guys have happening in Austin is really special. And it's fun for me to just drop in and, and you know, be a part of it. But I really do see the jazz community around the country and around the world as this really small family, mm. you know? And it's so cool when a guy like Alex Claffey, bass player, plays on my first record. Mm. I tour with him a lot. Bass players, they can't really bring a bass everywhere, right? Sure. I mean, look how big that thing is. You're yeah, not putting it in the overhead on uh, United, you know? <laughs> or uh, Spirit or something. But, uh, <laughs> you know, Spirit? yeah, the worst airline ever. Frontier. No, Well, no, they've combined now. What, Did you know one? that? Spirit no. and Frontier are combining to create the worst airline experience ever. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> That's what they're uh, advertising. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, they are combining, though. They, but, they should, uh, their tagline should just be, Spirit and Frontier Airlines, what, question mark, it's $23. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, what do you expect? Yeah, right. What do you expect? Um, no, but, like, it's amazing. I remember the first time I was touring with Claffy, 
and he magically gets like a bass. Every city we're in, yeah. every gig, someone at the sound check comes rolling in with this beautiful instrument. <laughs> I'm like, dude, we're in Detroit. How'd you find this bass? Yeah. Dude, we're in Nanaimo on an island in Vancouver. How do you have <laughs> this bass that Ray Brown played on some album? And you know what? It's this like community mm-hmm. where it's like, you know, you have this uh, colony of ants that all like work together uh, to like keep the hill going. Yeah. Like these bass players know that one day I'm going to be on the road and I'm going to need a bass that doesn't suck. So if someone ever comes to town yeah. and needs a bass, I have their back because I'm trusting that eventually they'll have mine. So there's this incredible community where any city Claffy goes to, he can put out the bat signal and some bass <laughs> player will like drop everything to give this guy his instrument for a night. Yeah. And you know what? I can tell you in ex- exact anecdotes where guys put on Facebook in New York, oh my God, I need a bass for this recording session in three hours. Yeah. And Claffy hooks him up, you know? So yeah. that that is one example of the way that like the jazz community is like an ant colony and we all kind of work together we have one hive mind yeah and that's the only way we're going to keep the music going man man this is an open invitation to claffy i'm going to look directly in the camera we're going to come to new york with a film crew we're going to pay for one of those spotlights and it's going to be a bass instead of the bat signal we're going to film an instagram <laughs> reel with you in a bat suit it's going to happen with the voice claffy has to be like we need a bass we need a bass <laughs> Just in the batman voice hey man did i see that at one of the terramoto uh uh jams that you had verified cupcakes made oh christian i'm so glad that you noticed that <laughs> yes and for all of you watching i am in fact a verified artist on instagram that's at bb jazz i i i verified on instagram um, no, actually, that was a friend of mine. It was really cute. I was way, way, way too excited than anyone should be to be verified sure. on Instagram. And when they got done, this friend of mine, she ordered them and she presented them to me at Terramoto, which I immediately then in a very meta way was like, we have to get content. We have to get yeah, a picture sure, of this. Sure, sure, sure. I must tag Instagram, hashtag verification, hashtag blue checkmark cupcakes. And, uh, you know, because I got I got pissed because Fifeke got verified before me, oh, okay. which is totally BS because I have <laughs> way more followers than him. OK, and I was way on the Instagram thing long before Fifeke even was on it. And then he got verified before me. And that just in, that just sent me into a fury, into a rage, Too much a rage. And I had to get verified. A whirling so. dervish. But you know who's not verified? Claffy. So, hey, oh. sorry, man. Maybe maybe you can apply again. <laughs> maybe if you attach an article of playing with me, that might like oh give you enough clout God. to get verified. Ooh, I hope he doesn't watch this. Ooh. He's going to be he's going to be mad. Claffy, that's water He'll in his salty. cup. It's not tea, but he is about to you spill. You know what? It, I have to say, Claffy, oh my gosh, every Brian Carter verified. Benny <laughs> Manac verified. Like if you ever want to come to Austin, Claffy, I guess you might have to like get that check mark before you do a residency? Is that like the baseline requirement? Uh, it could, it could be. <laughs> it could be. I don't know how this like, became like that is, me using session. your show to it's like troll my friend. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Cut. This is, none of this is making it. No, it's making it all. <laughs> and we'll bring down Claffy. You we'll do an to, episode with him. Because I feel so bad. And then he'll get to cut you in the camera. There you go. And then we'll splice it together and it'll there be you. like Well, a, he can try. He tries to do comebacks, but you can I always win. Dude, do you remember fun. epic rap battles of history? Of course. Dude, can we get you and Alex? You got to do that. Or like jams, do... you know, they like where they have like the duels, you know, like Ashanti versus, you know, whoever. Like you should do that with Jazz. Shanti? Ashanti. Oh, Ashanti. I thought you were saying like Shanti, like the workout guy. Oh, I was like I don't know, but I'd be thing? down for that. How about some like jazz YouTube high intensity workout training videos? The the per- whoever leads P90X versus Shanti who leads Insanity. Cool. It's we're gonna make it happen, man. Bobby, what? Who's the guy? Wasn't that like a workout guy? Bobby Blanks or something? I guess so. Am I, I imagining that? Guy. I, I don't. Know. It could be. It could be. Clearly, I work out. We'll so, just. Think, I mean, we'll just have the names like crudely flash at the bottom of the screen. Nice. It'll be great, man. You are. It, it is. It is definitely no secret that you're very charismatic. But when did that come along? Were you always that way? Like, because when we're like. I, I do this thing where I like ask questions and then I continue speaking. I promise I'll give you a, just a very straight question. It's in a all moment. good. But uh, I'm not exactly giving you like perfectly cuttable 10 second answers. Uh, I feel like I answer. It takes me seven minutes later. You're not going to be able to use any of this. You're going to have to cut it all up. It's a long form show. Okay, this cool. is, we're, we're learning together in cool, a safe cool, space. Cool, cool, you know? cool. 
We're so, shedding continue. on camera. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I think that, you know, when we're around the ages of between like 11 and 15, it's either we're begging for attention or we're like, don't look at me or I'll die, you know? So like, how are you around those ages? You know, I'm, I'm very fortunate and I feel very blessed that I knew who I was at a very early time in my life. Okay. And I don't take that for granted because we all know people that we went to high school with that were very bright, very smart, and then they go to college and they kind of just get a generic liberal arts kind of major because they don't know what to do. Sure. Because the, the reality is they're brilliant, smart people that would excel in a wide variety of fields. So you have people that are like, oh, maybe I want to go into biology. Oh no, actually I will do engineering or no, I'll do nursing or med school. Sure. And people bop around because it's just like they, they're struggling to find their, their North star or their purpose, mm. but it's not because they're not brilliant qualified people. It's just like, you know, that's an experience for people. What sure. should I do? What do I do with my life? What am I passionate about? Who am I? And yeah. I've been very, very fortunate that for whatever reason, like the, the me that you see sitting here now, this was me when I was like nine years old, mm. you know, it was the same deal. I might've had a little more hair, you know, a little less facial hair, but I was the same person. And I always knew who I was. I always knew exactly what I was going to be doing with my life. I never had to spend two minutes worrying about where I'm going to go to college or mm. what I'm going to do. I just feel like I always had my purpose. I always had my North star. Sure. I always had my calling. And with my personality, I was always comfortable who I was. Mm. And that's something that any artist, a lot of my friends, people, that's what your 20s are about. Not just as an artist, but as a human being. Right. Going on that journey, becoming an adult, having these life experiences, and forming who you are as a person. Mm. And of course I went through that. And there is evolution as a person and artist from one of a kind, my first record, to a lot of living to do my second record. But even within that, I was never shy about being myself mm. and what comes with that kind of level of, of charisma and confidence is that people who are not as sure of who they are are not going to like that mm. and people who see someone that is genuinely happy and things like that misery loves company so that is going to attract detractors mm -hmm. and you know we were laughing about you know trolls in the comments on live streams like yeah. long before people were trolling live stream comments i had people trolling me in real life i had people talking <laughs> shit in the back of the club while i was playing gigs you know and i understand that my sort of charisma attracts you know kind of people that are going to say hey why is this guy up there thinking he's hot shit you know yeah. why is he acting like that but you know i've gotten good advice from other musicians that the great Master drummer Joe Farnsworth had a conversation with me one time on the phone where he was just like, Benny B, you know, man, you're great, man. Keep doing what you're doing, man. Like, if you have haters, you're doing something right, man. Rip. <laughs> and, you know, that, that means a lot coming from someone that I look up to, someone sure. like Joe Farnsworth like that, just to say, it's you I like, you know, and, and just keep being yourself. Yeah. And, uh, you know, F the haters. In. Right. That's the end. Of the yeah. like, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> just like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, um, man. Also, you, and that's great too, because like, I feel like we can get really in our head. Uh, I used to like always read comments on anything. Like there was me too, man. There was a thing where we. I remember getting so mad. Like the first time that I saw a comment, it was like the live stream. And it wasn't even like a good live stream, but it was just like of the tree for the tree lighting in Zilker Park like five years ago. And we were playing this arrangement of Jingle Bells. It was like a Denver in the Mile High mm -hmm. orchestra arrangement. And somebody comments in this like video that like 20,000 people are watching and they're just like, why can't he just sing the song right? Because I was like doing, like taking liberties. And I was just like, like I was talking to Lydia because I was watching it back later. And I was like, I just, I'm, I'm so mad. Like, like that's, it's, that's jazz, baby. Like, I what are know, you talking no, about? And she was like, I realize this is your first one. Yeah. Never look at the comment yeah. section. Yeah. Because it's just like, you know, or maybe do it and absorb like the energy that they had to put into it and then say, now I'm stronger. 
Yeah, man. Or you could just do like the Kevin Durant and just have your burner account and just re respond to all of them as like, you know, random awesome cowboy, one, two, three, four, five. And be like, you don't know what you're talking about. Christian Wiggs is a brilliant genius, you know. Because I see some of the comments on YouTube too. I'm tempted. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've like started to write this like bitter retort to some troll. And then I'm like, no, I'm not going to even dignify this with a response. Right. I'm not going to get in the mud. <laughs> And then I just go on a fake account and copy and paste it. Yeah, there. that was why I loved it. I told you yesterday that somebody <laughs> made that comment on Butch Miles' episode oh, of yeah, the show. Yeah, yeah. And I loved that, like, I sent to Brian in a text message. I was like, look at this guy. Like, what's he doing? And then Brian went and made yeah, the comment. Yeah, and I was yeah, like, yeah. it instantly has so much more clout. I didn't tell him to do it. <laughs> but it was just like, all right. Cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah, man. Man, uh, I want to ask you uh, another just quick question before we wrap is, um, you know, and then we have our, our speed round at the end. Cool. But uh, you're traveling all the time. The hashtag travel mode engaged is alive and well. Um, I think a lot of people see that and really kind of fetishize the idea of like being on the road, traveling, doing all this stuff. I mean, right now, like in the past, like five days, you've been in what, like, Four cities, yeah. you know, yeah, something yeah, like that, yeah. if not more. Um, but what is not on camera all the time is how much that can take a toll and how we really have to like structure like a regiment, you know, to stay sane and like to take care of our body because our music and our output is very dependent on our body at least feeling a certain level percent percentage of like good, mm. right? What is, whether you're in town and always hustling or you're traveling overseas or domestically, what is that regimen for you? Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. As a matter of fact, when Gabriella picked me up from the airport yesterday, we were sitting at lunch, we were talking about yeah. traveling and this, you know, this old adage of half of the job of being a musician is traveling and showing yeah. up there. You know, that's half the gig. Yeah. You have to perform, but the other half is like, you have to get there. Yeah. And sometimes that's what you're getting paid for. You're getting paid for this connection and this early ass flight and like that is as much where the money is than what you do on stage. Diego Rivera just said that to me on the phone the other day. He was like, I play the music for free. Yeah. It's, it's is my Diego time, coming right? out here? Yeah. Oh my yeah, gosh, yeah. he's the man. I yeah. love him, man. We we just played together Ulysses band. He's in the the camp I teach at yeah. in Tokyo and he's an incredible educator. You got to have him do something yeah. with like the students out here, man. He's yeah. Brilliant. Was that the uh, hit you guys did with Marquise? Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man, I want to see videos from Dude, that and Diego is dude. also like the ultimate like just best dad vibes. Like we were in yeah. we were in like Winnetka, Illinois at at midnight. There was no food anywhere. All of a sudden he sends a group chat to the entire big band. Hey cats, ordered five pizzas. We'll be in the lobby in 30. Come on. Like he didn't ask anybody for money, but he like created a hang. Talk about community yeah. building. That cat like manufactured a team building exercise yeah. by buying some pizzas, which was deep. <laughs> But the, the dude. Yeah, man. But but as, as to to your point, um, I think that people's personalities, you know, are going to dictate sort of the work that they do. And there are some great musicians. Um, I think of the great Roger Humphreys, incredible mm. drummer, a legend, godfather of the scene in Pittsburgh. Benny Green just posted a thing the other day on his Facebook, taking a picture of Roger, who yeah. went to see Benny play with Christian McBride and Hutch in St. Louis. And Benny Green was just, you know, giving Roger his flowers, basically. Mm -hmm. And Roger is someone who went to New York at 23 years old, won an audition to play in Horace Silver's band, recorded on Song for My Father, recorded on African Queen, recorded on Jody Grind with <clears throat> Horace Silver, was on the road with Ray Charles as the drummer in his big band, you know, basically at that time, you know, he was right there with Lewis Hayes and Al Foster and, mm -hmm. and these drummers of, of that era. And if he wanted to stay in New York and stay on the road 350 days a year, he would probably be exalted and known in that same level. Yeah. But he had a family, he had kids. And hey, what a crazy idea. He liked being at home. He liked being in Pittsburgh. Yeah. And he created quite a career and life for himself there. And he also uplifted a local community for mm. generations for decades you know and they, you know his jersey will hang in the rafters in pittsburgh forever yeah. rightfully so and so someone like that you know we have to we have to you talked about fetishizing being on the road we have to get out the notion that being a touring musician or living mm -hmm. in new york 
is somehow like the stamp of approval. And yes. if you don't live in New York, if you can't get a gig at Birdland, then you know you're worthless because you're not making it in the big city. Or you know, if I'm not on the road, if you're just playing local gigs, then you know you're not you're not a big time artist because you aren't you aren't in the downbeat pole or whatever. And that's just number five. By uh, yeah. Way. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. As vocalist, yeah. but uh, we do want to get on the trumpet list soon. Um, <laughs> no, but you know, it's like there, there's just different strokes for different folks. There's different ways to skin a cat. And for me, I'm a Sagittarius. I love to travel, wanderlust. You know, like that suits <laughs> that suits my personality. I'm crazy. I love living in New York. I have, you know, I'm energized by having full days you know mm -hmm. i freak out when i don't have anything to do when i'm in a city that's a little bit more chill like austin or la or something i love it and i mm -hmm. relax for three days and yeah. then i go crazy because i need to get back to yeah. some psychotic place like new york city where i can just be spinning a thousand miles a minute that's just the way i'm wired so for me i feel at home in a hotel room on mm -hmm. the road and at this period of my life that sort of is what a lot of living to do was about. Like, mm. I want to take my music around the world. I want to live out of a suitcase. I want to do it. I want to do it up. But that could change. Yeah. I could reach another point in my life where, hey, I want to put down roots. I want to have a house. I want to mm. have a car. I want to play golf. I want to, you know, hang out with a family. Those yeah. kind of considerations. So for me, traveling, travel mode, all that stuff that I like romanticize on my Instagram that is who I am, yeah. but there's nothing wrong with people that like being in one place. They like their community. They like their situation. Mm -hmm. You don't have to validate your career by how long during out of the year you're on tour. Yeah. You know? So let me just say that first of all, and then more speaking to your point about regimen and routine is just how important self-care is mm -hmm. and mental wellness and physical wellness. And I thank God that we're growing up in a time where, you know, there is more empathy and understanding for mental wellness. Yes. And, you know, especially with, with, you know, men like us, it's not like something to be looked down upon. You have these athletes that are taking time off to get their mental health in order. And it's yeah. not something like, oh, this guy's mental. He's crazy. What the heck? This guy's, a, right. you know, who talks to a therapist? You know, that's lame. Like all of that stuff. You know, you said last night on the concert, you were making a joke. You're like, hey, don't worry about me, folks. Therapy's great. <laughs> but I mean, I think that's true. And, you know, we need to continue to to rail against that kind of like antiquated way of thinking that like physical wellness is important. Mental wellness is important. And, you know, I love sports. I like in being a musician to being an athlete and mm. uh, the way that my favorite athletes were so disciplined and so regimented. I take a lot of inspiration for that, the way I'm disciplined with my practice routine. Yeah. But also the idea of, you know, you look at someone like LeBron James and mm -hmm. he's 38 years old and they say, we've never seen a 38 year old play this well. What is he doing? He, he must be a god. He's, he's inhuman. Mm -hmm. No, he spends a million dollars a year regulating his body. He has a specific guy that monitors his sleep. He has a specific guy that tells him what fluids he needs, right? And the idea of, I want to be the LeBron James of trumpet. I yeah. want to be able to play trumpet and sing like I'm in my prime my mm -hmm. entire life, right? And we look at artists from earlier eras where they didn't have that kind of technology and understanding. And, you know, we love Frank Sinatra, right? And has mm -hmm. his voice matured over, the, over time. But, you know, Frank Sinatra, New York, New York, LA is my lady, later era Frank Sinatra, he paid a price for mm. decades of smoking and drinking sure. and partying and all of those things. And maybe, you know, if he had access to the same kind of research that LeBron James does, you know, maybe someone like Frank Sinatra is singing at 75 years old the way they did at 45 years yeah. old. So whatever that regimen is, whatever people do, we have to remember that our bodies as singers, especially, mm. are our instruments. And in the same way an athlete takes stretches before you work out and stretches mm. after you lift weights, we have to do that as, as right. musicians and singers too. I was watching you fill up your water bottle. You were like dumping different <laughs> bottles of water into your water bottle yeah. right before we went on stage last night. And even something as simple as don't forget to drink water is the difference between, you know, making it through a long run on the road and not making it. Yeah. And that's something you'd like really have to start doing, you know, ahead of time. Gotta like create those good habits before 
it's too late. Yeah, and well, you know, even the drinking water thing, when I start, like, I try to hydrate a lot, drink several of those, like, tall Yetis every day, but, like, I start, like, ultra hydrating, like, three days before the gig. Yeah. Because I go, like, I want to feel good leading up to the gig. I don't want to wake up and be like, oh, no, let me just slam water the entire day and then be neurotic and, like, scared yeah. that it's not going to come together for the gig, you know? Um, so, yeah, man, it, everything that you're saying about preemptive care and also just, like, especially talking about the mental wellness thing and, like, allowing yourself to be vulnerable, vulnerable. And like these athletes you're saying that, that have said, like, I can't remember who it was. There was, uh, a tennis player, I think who, who, uh, dropped out of one of the grand slams, like in the past, like six I months. I think one of the big like, ones too was Simone Biles, the gymnast. Or, that, yes. That's that, what it was. You yes. know, and people were like, you know, apoplectic that she could possibly drop out of mm -hmm. Olympics or something. And she's like, Hey, I need to get my, get my mental affairs in order. Exactly. You know? And like, Thank God. Oh, no, you're talking about Naomi Osaka. Yes. Same, yes, same, yes. same premise, yes, same situation. Right. And like, thank God someone like Serena Williams, who's like, you know, so respected in mm. that field was able to say, hey, look at what, you know, this young person is doing. We need to support her, you know? Yes, exactly. Uh, and like, that's like even more a testament to strength, right? To be yeah. able to say that and be like, I don't, I don't, I don't care what you think. I need to do what's best for me. I need to listen to my body. Uh, well, you know, uh, asking the uh, speed round questions, and then we'll go. We'll go have a nice cocktail. Let's do it. Um, the first one is speed round. If there is, that's right. Let's lean in. Start the clock. Thirty seconds on the clock now. Here we go. Now just. <laughs> um, if there's a record that you would tell everybody to go listen to right now, as soon as this is over, what would it be? Clifford Brown with strings. Boom. Why? Oh, I thought I thought it was like a speed round. I thought oh, we were just well, like oh, oh, we just could. Firing we, it well, it's faster. But okay. Yeah, right. Clifford Brown with strings. Why? Um, that was a very influential album for me growing up. Um, it Clifford Brown's trumpet sound to me has everything you could ever want in the mm -hmm. sound of an instrument. There is brightness um, and yet warmth. There mm -hmm. is brilliance and yet tenderness. Um, and you have different tracks where Clifford Brown is just playing breathtakingly efficient, incredible trumpet. Huh. And then you have these lush strings that anytime you hear a string section, you know, talking about Stephen Feifke coming down mm. and, and the kind of strings that he added to Veronica's last album, you automatically just feel like someone is just like hugging yeah. you when you hear a string section, yeah, you know? Right. So that album to me is like my feel good album. You know, if I ever need to smile or I need something to tuck me in musically, yeah. Clifford Brown with strings. Okay. Without fail. Second question. Favorite bass player? Christian McBride. <laughs> Alex Clapp. Alex Clapp. No. There we go. No, There's no we go. he's very <laughs> far down the list. Oh, no. No, I'm getting it. I'm getting <laughs> it's a rhyme it. session. Okay. Um, <laughs> greatest, greatest piece of advice you've ever been given? Greatest piece of advice I've ever been given. Wow. You, that's not a rapid fire question, bro. Yeah, that's gotta, like, I really got to think gotta about that. Best piece of advice I've ever been given. Oh, God. It's all right. It's not live. We can, we can cut. So well, I mean, I'm just trying to think of my biggest mentors who probably Sean Jones was my biggest mentor from about junior high school into college as my main trumpet teacher. And then in college, Lori Frank was mm -hmm. my trumpet teacher and she was like a renowned guru and kind of was my best friend at that time. Um, I think maybe the best advice that Lori gave me because she's on my mind was me in college wanting to spend my summers in New York, wanting mm -hmm. to get an apartment and not have to be in school and be able to go out. Mm -hmm. And Lori, every summer of my undergrad would kind of say, you know, I, I think you should go back home to Pittsburgh, have your, your mom do your laundry, play <laughs> some gigs with your dad, keep practicing, and mm -hmm. let's, let's think about it next summer. And finally, after I did my undergrad, she was like, I think it's time for you to get an apartment. You need to start working in New York this mm -hmm. summer. And she actually passed away that summer between my undergrad and my grad. Oh, so man. half the reason I was going back to Manhattan School of Music for my master's was to continue studying with her. And she passed away of cancer in between. Mm -hmm. And it was the type of thing where she didn't want everyone to know that she was sick because mm -hmm. she would have had people knocking on her door for a year straight around the world because that was the kind of you know impact she had on people. Sure. And she was you know reserved. She didn't want anyone pitying her or anything like that. But I really think that that was kind of her sort of like passing, you know, passing the baton to myself mm. to be my own teacher at that point. 
And I was so excited, so ready to get into the jam sessions in New York and get myself out there. And she had the foresight, you know, to tell a young person, 19, 20, 21, 22 mm -hmm. years old, that like, let, let's take a little bit more time to, to cook in the oven, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was basically the thinking was, once you kind of turn over the, the clock, you know, and the sand mm -hmm. of your career starts going, first impressions mean a lot. So if you walk into Smalls Jazz Club and you start taking a solo, no one is going to sit there and say, oh, how old do you think that guy is? He, he's mm -hmm. got to be, what, about a junior in college? Well, yeah. gosh, he sounds great for a junior in college. Just imagine what he'll sound like in a few years. No, they're going to say, oh, my God, that's Roy Hargrove. He just took a solo. Who's that kid? Ah, I have no idea. He sounds like a kid, you mm. know? Yeah. And that was so valuable because it reminded me that I shouldn't be in a rush to jump out there and shout out in front of everyone and announce that I'm here. She was saying, take more time, practice so that you're ready when your time comes. Because yeah. once you throw your name in the, in the, throw your hat into the ring, I'm in the same pool as Roy Hargrove, Wynton Marsalis, and Terrell Stafford, mm. and Sean Jones, all these guys that are my teachers and heroes. All of a sudden, someone needs a trumpet player for an album. Mm. We're on the same list, right. you know? And so, you don't want to jump out before you're done seasoning, you know, yeah. and there's no rush. And I say that to people all the time. Young students are in so infatuated with, I have to go to school in New York. I have to go to Juilliard. If I don't get into MSM, if I don't get into purchase, mm. if I don't get into new school. And the reality is for a lot of people at that age, you're not ready to stand sure. on stage next to someone like Roy Hargrove and shine, you yeah. know? And there are great educators and there are wonderfully air-conditioned practice rooms <laughs> in many universities. Hello, North Texas, for starters. Right. Talk about Diego Rivera, Michigan State, the program that Mike Dees and Ronnie Whitaker have up there is incredible. So I'm always just saying to younger musicians what was said to me at that time, which was the best advice, which is like, don't be in a hurry to you know start grabbing the brass rings like yeah, right. everything will be there for you but when you have time to practice when your only concern in life is getting better at your craft when you don't have all these other responsibilities of adulthood mm -hmm. that is precious time that time is gold and yeah. don't waste it because now i'm old <laughs> now <you're> old. <laughs> don't worry benny you got a lot of living i'm to still do. hot i'm still hey, hot. i got uh, a lot of living to do my I'm god so hot. you are you're still hot and let me ask you the final question of the show. You know this is coming, or maybe you've forgotten, which will make it even more fun, is uh, we all have gigs from hell where things go totally sideways. Ooh. You told me about a situation being, I believe, in the Ukraine where everything was frozen over last time, and that tour was just a nightmare. Trigger warning. Oh, my God, I'm but remembering it's, that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been a couple years uh, now since our, well, a year since our last show episode. Can you think of a particularly hellish gigging experience? Oh my gosh. Well, you know, what comes to mind, I recently had this residency on the books and I was bringing a band and we were going to play a number of gigs in another city. And then at the very last minute, the promoter got COVID and everything got ruined. And that was probably the worst thing that's ever happened to Just me. Just a real son of a bitch. And recently, could like you imagine the audacity, the gall, the gall of someone truly. to get COVID? I mean, How just like, dare they? What a... Let's get the let's get a mob. <laughs> yeah, like, cancel that guy. Come on, let's get in no. the comment section. Man, you know I. Ouch. <laughs> I I've really been been very fortunate and very blessed to be surrounded by great people, mm -hmm. and you know, very much the kind of treatment that artists get when they come here and take part in this residency and you know play at monks and and be in this scene here. Those are the situations that I now because of those past experiences, mm -hmm. I. I am able to filter out, you yeah. know, those horrible gigs. Sure. And I think every artist, as their career goes on, those horrible gig experiences come few and far between because mm. you have those experiences and you learn what not to do, what sure. not to say yes to. And for me, saying no, is a, that's always been a big problem, yeah. right? And so it's almost like people that's, you know, that are like dating forever and they go on all these horrible dates and they, they think that that's just bad experiences. But I think it's just as valuable to have a horrible nightmare gig to know what you want to say no to, to mm. know what factors are you getting paid enough? 
Is the travel, are they doing a direct flight? Are they doing connections? Do you get to pick who the piano player is? Do you have to show up and play with some person that you've never played with? So in the time that we spoke is the last year or two, man, I, whatever, I haven't had those mm. nightmare experiences because I've learned what the warning signs are and the red flags. And if I get an email about a tour and they don't tell me how much money it is or they don't mention anything about, you know, the flight itinerary, I know that I'm probably going to end up in some train car in the, you know, in the middle of the winter in Ukraine for 25 hours without any heat. And I don't want to put myself in that situation. So, you know, I, I haven't put myself, thankfully, in, in many of those situations and really... I feel like I'm, I'm living the dream and living a charmed life because, you know, I get to come out here and hang out with you and the team here at Bandstand is just like world-class treatment oh, and it's a family and it's friends and it feels like a vacation <laughs> and a gig, you know, that's what I'm, that's what I'm hunting. I want all of my tours to feel like a vacation uh, while someone's paying me to do it, you know, that's, amazing. that's the goal. And I've been really fortunate, man. It's, it's, that's, those are the environments i've been finding myself in lately and i just want to keep that going my man sweetness and grace all the way benny benack the third love you man thanks for having me